Hey sinners, it's Adam Knox here. Today's subject is a sobering one. You see, I've spoken about quite length in this podcast about the importance of mental health and mental strength and the strain that certain portions of the left-hand path will take upon the practitioner. This path is not for an amateur. It's not for a dabbler. It is definitely for somebody that is serious and is able to go all in and someone who has done the work or is willing to do the work upon themselves. My guest today is a man who has walked the other side of that. It is someone who has seen the other side of mental health and mental illness and has suffered and battled with that to great cost for himself and his loved ones, who has made it, however, in finding the left-hand path, has made it through to the other side, has restored his own mind and has become a guide and a teacher for others. Some of his books include the book of Soul Retrieval, where he speaks very extensively about the recovery of this process. And the book he's probably most known for is The Black Witch, The Demonic Tongue. Enoch Petroselli is truly a magician that has walked his talk. He has gone from the darkest places to a place of power and strength. He himself today, a massive, powerful man, not only in stature, but in soul, shares with us today some of the deepest and most important insights on what is essential for us to recognize as we take the battle of mental health seriously inside of our practice. It is very easy for many to fall off the wheel and especially how they get confused when they look at these archetypes. Enoch shares with us some essential paradigms, mindsets and principal beliefs on how to overcome mental illness and how to guard ourselves against it as we take on the great work of this very forbidden and intense path. Join us today as I discuss with Enoch some of these deep ideas and the impacts that they have. We discuss exorcisms to mental health, to battling Yahweh and a number of other forces, the power of cursing and protection, the utilization of these, including the core beliefs and ideas and attitudes as we cultivate the true will and overcome our inertia and our own limitations to become truly powerful beings. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this essential conversation today. And remember, live deliciously. Enoch, it's an absolute gift and a pleasure to be able to share a platform with you. You're an amazing man. Thank you so very much for being here. Hey, not a problem. I'm glad to be here and I'm excited to talk to you and get into some uh, specific topics. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I've been, you know, I've been uh, a fan of yours since the, the first time I picked up The Black Witch. And I think the reason this book has been so powerful for me was not simply because you know, the discussion, the revealing of the demonic tongue that you were sharing inside of that, but the absolute depth in which you went through the entire journey. It's such a complete, absolute grammar and handbook, I think, for everybody in the left-hand path. But the way you opened that book, and I encourage anybody, if you haven't read the book, please pick up a copy. There's there's a real treasure inside of that. Uh, but, one of the, but, you know, I'm not going to spoil that for people. I think they, they should pick up the book and find it themselves. But inside of that, you highlight the subject of mental health and your own journey with that. And I think for anybody inside of the occult path, there's a lot of the young ones that come in and there's even people that have been in it for a long time that don't know what they're getting themselves into. They're not ready for it. But what I, what I really loved of your approach, it's almost like you've used the left-hand path as a way to help with mental health. Can you, you know, I know that's a big question and that's a big solid conversation, but would you mind helping us unpack that a little bit? Absolutely. I will quantify it uh, the best that I can. Um, so in, the, in my book, I tell my story about 
um, experiencing a severe mental illness and experiencing real uh, auditory visual hallucinations that weren't so much, um, you know, there was a legit illness, but what caused that illness is the question that, that I kind of go into in my book. And I sincerely feel that it's more than just a chemical imbalance in the brain when we experience a mental illness, that it is a spiritual occurrence in that um, if you open yourself up to the uh, left-hand path or even the right-hand path, and you don't have enough protection as far as um, shielding yourself and having a strong uh, mind, having a strong mind is a big factor, having a strong willpower. Um, if somebody, for example, places a curse on you um, early on in your working, uh, early on in your path, and you haven't developed the skill of protecting yourself and defending yourself, that curse, whether it's from a, a, a spirit or a person, um, doesn't matter where it comes from, the curse goes to the weakest link in your uh, armor, so to speak. If you have a mind that is prone to mental illness, that is weakened from something else, stress um, or anything like that, that will be the weak link that the curse will go to and it will break that link and the rest kind of falls apart after that link is broken. And it can go to uh, physical uh, health as well if the curse hits you in that way, if that's your weak link. So with people that start magic, I always, always um, very much, um, what's the word, elucidate the importance of being protected and having the knowledge of how to protect yourself before you even get into the ascension pieces of magic. If you don't know how to protect your energy and your mind, you are asking for a disaster. Like if you raise your psychic power and psychic energy, you are turning on a beacon <laughs> for like these lower vibrational entities who want to push your buttons and give you uh, anxiety and fear. They exacerbate those conditions in order to feed on your psychic energy. So if you don't know how to protect yourself, I don't recommend um, doing rituals that enhance your level of awareness too much. Like it's a foundation. If you don't have the foundation, the castle can just um, crumble. The foundation is everything. I if you want to go up, strong foundation is what's going to keep you from falling over. I think what you're what 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 you're saying here is it's it's one of those overlooked things because I mean there's a lot of marketing out there and there's a lot of excitement and everyone's trying to get the the latest book and the latest ideas and they're chasing, but it's oftentimes experts that are publishing a lot of those books and a person just coming in, they don't, you know, as you point out, they don't have that foundation. They don't have their gamma leel, their yes. So they don't have that dimension worked on. Um, I had a conversation a while back when we had Curtis Joseph on and he pointed out an interesting example when somebody was having these problems at these top levels, because they're working at that higher level, that sometimes it's important to just go back down, go back down a step. Um, in order to kind of help you stabilize. But one of the other things that I, that I like that you're raising here is that you need to protect yourself magically. You need to be able to do that magically. But the other important factor is that you also have to be protected psychologically. Your mind itself needs to be strengthened inside of that process. Now, I've, I, I, I believe that even in my own work, one of the things that I teach my students to do is basically go through a curriculum of neurolinguistic programming, psychological studies, personal self-awareness and development to get that kind of going. But this is not some a tool set that everybody has and they don't always have the time and the resources. You went through a very intense series of experiences inside of your journey. What were some of those core foundational beliefs and values or distinctions that, that you cultivated, that you would share 
with somebody that is on the spot, maybe somebody that's starting it, he, they're not really feeling the stability of that. They're excited, but they have those mixed associations. What would you share? What, what can you share with us about that? Um, for me, I can only speak to what I have experienced, obviously. Um, it's very important not only to have protection, but part of protection has always been the attitude of, I'm willing to go there and fight back. You know, I'm willing to um, crush you if you're trying to crush me. And that goes for a person trying to destroy you or uh, magically speaking, <laughs> or like a, a uh, parasitic entity trying to destroy you, it doesn't matter. If something's willing to posture and attack you, you have to, you have to always be willing to fight back offensively, not just surrounding yourself in white light and hoping they go away. That doesn't work usually. So you have to be willing to crush your enemy. I like, oh, that kind of reminds me of a good author for people to check out is Robert Greene. I don't know if you've heard mm. of him. A big fan of Robert Greene, especially his strategies of war and his human nature, his latest one, um, an absolute genius. And somebody I think that's a powerful example, especially because he had the stroke uh, yes. and having to have overcome that being such a strong and respected man and such an effective strategist. Um, and I was recently watching a podcast of his, so a very interesting kind of metaphor or an archetype, I think for this, this principle yes. in many ways. Yes. Um, another good guy to look into if you're trying to, uh, strengthen your willpower in your mind and having the, uh, ability to be aggressive. If you feel like you don't have that in you. Um, on a mental level, is uh, Jocko Willick. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's, he's kind of the Marine, uh, excuse me, Navy SEAL, I believe, and he has a podcast, and I watch that a lot, and it kind of gives me that uh, strength of mind. It motivates me, kind of gives me a little push when I feel like I'm slipping or whatever. So definitely for anybody, you know, who needs some war in their life, ability to wage war on weakness of your own mind is a good one to look into. I love, I love that you're raising these, um, instead of how so many other occultists will kind of just, you know, reference to go summon this entity as an, as an escape. Um, these are, these are distinct mindsets that are so useful. Jocko is brilliant. Robert Green is brilliant. Um, there, there are a few that are absolutely amazing accomplishments that we can accomplish or that we can recognize or learn from. And I think one of the core ideas, and this is something that's been coming up for me a lot lately with a lot of the workings that I've been doing recently. And it was this idea that uh, the old classic that for magic, the two most powerful magical tools that we have is the imagination and the will. And I think a lot of people get into the path and they're so stuck on developing the imagination, the visualization skills, the almost raising the awareness that they forget that we need to cultivate that will, but a strong, almost, uh, Chris Wood, I think said it, uh, we need to, how tamed are we as people, you know, and to be a left-hand path practitioner, I think to be a magician in the first place or a witch in the first place means to be again wild, to unlock your your slight your aggression not necessarily in a negative sense but in a in a way that allows you to confront the challenge not just roll over to it that js actually mentioned this in his journey with belial where it was only when he got the strength to be respectful but also take his stand as authority in his own godhood you know claim his his space that the dynamic started shifting for the first place uh, and and kind of what i'm hearing from you is the same thing and it's also it's something that you live by you know you're always in the gym you're a martial artist yourself you know you're you're somebody that really you know walks the talk you're not just a you know, uh, positive, you know, book, uh, intellectual, you're, you're a mean, strong man <laughs> with um, a big heart and a profound mind. And I want to find out if we take on these different psychologies. So I'd say that we first, we look at our mindsets, we look at role modeling experts to really not be as tame when it comes to the spiritual dimension, but own our position, own our authority, be respectful, but not be as tame. But now another idea or another concept, and especially around this idea of protection that I hear a lot from different left-hand path practitioners is 
you know, maybe they grew up in the right hand or they grew up more in golden dawn and traditional ceremonial magic. And they're used to doing protection rituals such as the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, um, middle pillar banishing, the classics. And now they, they, they kind of push away from that because they're going into the other extreme. Um, instead of just progressing on the magic, they, they seem to still have this dual mindset, you know, of left and right and light and dark and all of this kind of stuff. And then they don't want to do any protection because they feel it's offensive. What mm. are techniques that someone like that should be looking into? And what is, what is a mindset that someone like that should maybe be adopting? Um, for me, uh, I always, if I feel something, and this happens a lot, um, like vampiric spirits, whether a person sent them or they're just a random entity will try to break my defenses and attack me. Um, you, like I said before, you have to be willing to perform the magic. You don't go on the left hand path and expect to get away with being lazy. You know, you have to, if you're not willing to defend the power that you gain, uh, it will get taken. You will lose it, uh, at least to an extent. And for me, I would do curses uh, on a regular basis and not target necessarily other people. I don't target other practitioners unless they are attacking me. Mm. And I know it for 100% certainty. Uh, but do general cursing of parasitic entities or enemies, what you would define as enemies, um, on a regular basis. And what that does, um, it draws a boundary line that they know they can't cross without becoming uh, your target. You know what I mean? Mm. Even with the uh, right-hand path, uh, well, slave gods like Yahweh, I, I don't, I don't know if Yahweh is like a higher god that um, encompasses. When I say Yahweh, what I'm trying to say is I'm talking about the egregor of the. Uh, Judeo or Christian religions, sometimes he will step in and try to fuck with me. Mm. And uh, I do the same thing with him. I don't care if he's a fucking God <laughs> or whatever he is, a platform. I will target him and I will curse him with everything I have. And that draws a boundary. It doesn't, you can't destroy a spirit completely, obviously. It'll just, he'll just take a blow and he'll back off. And that takes care of it for however long uh, time, you know. But um, I don't put up with entities trying to push me around. I don't put up with people trying to push me around uh, magically. Um, and I don't think anybody should. You should be able to protect yourself at any time. Be ready at all times. Another thing I do, I have sigils that I print out with my printer or draw them or whatever. And I will put my intention on the sigils. And... I'll put sigils on those sigils that have specific meanings of binding and destruction and devouring. Mm -hmm. And it's like a loaded weapon that I have at all times. And that gives me a lot of peace. You know why? Because the enemies, people that are your enemy um, or spirits that are your enemy, they see what you're doing. They're, they're watching you. If they're, if they're your enemy, they're doing reconnaissance. <laughs> and... So they know that you're ready to throw down magically. And because of that, you will get attacked less. If you're ready at all times to just hit that ritual room and throw the biggest fucking curse you can with no possibility of it being returned to you, that's another thing. You want to make sure it doesn't get reflected back to you. And having a magic, having a mirror, uh, I like to use a silver mirror and charging it with that intention that um, curses reflected back to you get reflected to their intended target or energy that is negative, harmful, intrusive energies, curses, unwanted spells that are getting sent to you get reflected back to the person sending them. And just having those things set up and ready at all times is just, um, for me, has been really helpful in my progression uh, magically, not only defending my energy, but the thing is, your power and your energy is natural. It's in you already. That's why chakra removal works. 
if you take out your chakras, you're not losing anything. You're just losing control devices that regulate the power that's already in you. So if you're that ultimate source of all power and you know that, then what's stopping that from manifesting? Bindings. There's all kinds of fucking bindings on a human. Mm. And you're born with them and they're placed on you as you go. And you lose soul parts, etc., from trauma in your life. Um, and in order to remove those bindings and chains, you have to fight to get it. You have to you have to destroy those bindings, cut those chains. Um, and the way to do that is is war, is fighting back against forces that don't want you to advance spiritually, don't want to you to access your power. Hmm. So that's I how think I feel about it. The way the way that that comes across to me is very useful because I think you know we said earlier you talked about the, the the necessity of a good foundation and developing that good foundation and almost using proactively the curse using proactively to stand as a warrior to stand as a god of war I mean if we're if we're taking the stance that you know all the planets are fundamentally components of ourselves then we're fundamentally components of those and if we're not cultivating our Mars alongside our Jupiter, alongside our moon, alongside our Saturn, we're not progressing as Magi. And I had this conversation recently um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a gathering with other magicians. And somebody was talking about how, you know, bringing in the spirit to do these things is a good thing. And I'm like, okay, it's a, it's a good thing to bring in the spirit. But the same, I think that young clairvoyants learn when we begin the mirror gazing, you start seeing the spirits coming through your face there often is a correspondence psychologically between the kind of spirits that you attract. And if we want to be in a position where we're working with higher, more powerful beings, we need to be correspondent to them as well. So we need to have a similar quality of strength. Um, I remember it was years back and I was working with Belial and um, I was, I was feeling sick. I had sickness running through my body and I try to do the, positive thinking thing saying i'm not sick i'm healthy i'm healthy i'm healthy and he just said no you're sick own it and i was i was a little caught off guard i'm like how do i how do i just own it because that's the fear we don't want to give in to the illness mental or physical at any level um because but what we're not realizing we're doing is we're submitting to it we're claiming ourselves the victim of this thing we're claiming it has power over us Versus one of the attitudes that I've realized in the dark path is when I'm, I am the demonic, I am in essence, I am the very source of the illness, the very source of the pain and the suffering. And only when I take that ownership and I stop playing the victim of it, but I proactively utilize it, then the power dynamic gets shifted and I no longer have that resistance. So I really, I really love this, like the proactive attack to Yahweh. That's a, you know, it's a, because again, these are the slave archetypes in many formats, you know, for us. Uh, but I want to kind of dig in a little bit more here because one of the, one of the concepts that's coming through very nicely is this psychosomatic maturing that happens, you know, for, for the witch um, the development of the warrior archetypes, those fire elements and I always say that the, the elemental dimensions are very underdeveloped in a lot of witches. They want to go through the chase, but they forget that I need to cultivate the fire inside of myself, the warrior, the earth, the finance, the, the material, my body, you know, looking at my body and looking at my physical health, how big a role does all of that play for you inside of this? I mean, is it, is it enough to just go into the ritual and do the curse or what is the impact of, of going to the gym, of eating right, of doing all these things going to have on that? Uh, the gym, um, I mean, you said you mentioned wealth and you mentioned health. And that sounds like a cliche, but they're the same thing in my eyes. Your body is what you use to experience things in your life. And if your body's unhealthy, you know, your experience isn't that great, you know? Um, if you don't take care of your body, that's the foundation. It's one of the foundations. I mean, I take it to a little bit of an extreme when it comes to weight training. Not, not so bad that it's unhealthy, but at least going to the gym uh, or getting some kind of exercise is so important for not only your mental health, but your spiritual health. Mm. That, uh, I mean, it releases endorphins. It, 
it helps you train the will and the will, like you mentioned earlier, is a huge component, will and, and imagination. If you have the will to push your body and do the things that are difficult for you and that you don't want to do, um, you do, but you don't. You know, you wish you could. If you wish you could, then you really do want to do it. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. So just, you just have to, little by little, struggle and build your will. And going to the gym is part of that for me. And I think it's a big and important piece for a lot of people. Obviously, there are priorities if you are struggling in some way and you can't go to the gym because you're overwhelmed with another area of your life being out of balance and you have to take care of it for some reason. That makes sense to me. It's okay to take a break and uh, take a week off from the gym or uh, take a day off from the gym. It's not okay to stop completely and let your body fall apart and to eat shit all the time and expect to uh, be healthy mentally and spiritually. You know, you have to eat like a warrior and take care of your body. Um, so to answer your question, it's a huge factor. And the energy that you put into your body um, comes back and helps you in other ways in your life because you, you know, you just, you feel better in every way. Muscle soreness is a factor, but it's not really something that can, that will hold you back if you eat, eat enough protein and or have a healthy diet, get enough water. It really is mitigated by the diet piece and the sleep piece. That's another thing is getting enough sleep. I know people want to push themselves and be strong and get a shitload of work done and get after it in life, but sleep is very important for your body and your mind it regulates it helps your hormones if your hormones are out of balance your body is and your mental health get fucked up so there's all kinds of stuff that's important when it comes to physical health you know it's a huge factor there's there's a couple of things that you know there were things that you said there that just i i want to dive in a little bit deeper because you opened up a couple of other things and there's just something about your energy that um I've always, I've always really, really enjoyed in, in how you present things versus when I see you in the gym and you're just pumping iron like a beast uh, and versus you're channeling and it's almost this euphoric light that kind of comes through of energy. There's a, there's a very strong, even though externally you're very masculine, there's a very natural feminine energy that also comes through. There's a very deep balance between the vibrations that, that you're able to present. Um, and I think this is a, this is a, big, is a big key because a lot of people polarize, they do the one or the other, and they, you know, it's either the tough love or they don't get the compassion. And this is also another strain, I think, for mental well-being. You know, the always being on, like 24 seven, trying to be on the whole time, and not realizing you're putting too much strain on that psychological muscle. How do you strike the balance? How do you, you know, it's that work-life balance. It's that feminine, masculine balance inside of your energy system, that inner outer world. You know, what are some of the key key ideas for you? And, and also, if you wouldn't mind. What do you think are some risks that people should be aware of in their magical path that could make them prone of becoming unbalanced in that? Uh, in your magical path, I highly recommend people build a structure and stick with that structure. Um, meditation, a basic thing that people should be doing. Hmm. I don't want to hear people say, I can't meditate. It's too hard. You know, I, you try it and you, if you're not good at it the first time, you keep going back for 20 minutes a day, every day, and you get better and better at it. And that builds the mental strength. Way to maintain balance is, like I said, the structure. That's where I was going with that. Um, working hard during the day and then at night, sitting in stillness, meditating, um, works wonders for um striking balance, like allowing the reflex of relaxation to take place. Like you work hard all day um, or you play during the day, whatever you're doing, you're going to fall asleep so much easier than if you're um, not using your energy and doing the things you want to do with your life during the day. Um, you. Like when, at the end of the day, I'm when I hit you know my pillow at night, I just fall asleep pretty quick because I'm tired, you know, and it just it, it's instant almost because 
like I said, I'm using that energy. A factor of, uh, regarding sleep is clearing your space before you go to bed so you're not, um, your mind isn't racing and you're having trouble falling asleep. If your mind is racing and you're having trouble falling asleep, usually it's because there's a lot of psychic energy that's not really good for you that's still present in your space and you have to um, banish it and clear your space before you go to bed. Um, another thing for me personally is working with goddess energies like the dragon uh, Typhon, for example, or new Isis. I've found in my practice that new Isis and Typhon are the same entity and they're just you know, the new Isis is the anthropomorphic form of Typhon. Huh. You haven't heard of that, or you may have if you read uh, Kenneth Grant books. Yes, yes, a big fan. You are a big fan of those? I love those books. Uh, <laughs> but um, connecting with goddess energy is important for men, I think, or people that are very masculine, whether you're male or female, and because it kind of gives you the balance of that feeding that side of yourself and feeling that energy within yourself when you connect with it. Mm. It's connecting. It's, it really depends on the person, whether you're um, inwardly more feminine or masculine, how much you would be drawn to, you know what I mean? Mm. But if you're a very masculine person like me, um, having that feminine goddess energy uh, uh, meditating with it and feeling that energy within yourself is a huge factor and it really helps a lot to do. Um, and the opposite, if you are very feminine and you embrace a lot of feminine energy in your life, you may want to connect with the masculine energy more, masculine demonic energy. Mm. I like um, I like that idea. I think there's um, one of the things that I had to learn that was quite difficult for me was when the feminine energy kind of started coming up in my body, I would get it locked in certain places. I, I would kind of get it locked in my heart, um, not realizing these were actual uh, attachment wounds within myself. They, these were mental issues within myself because I had anxiety um, growing up around the feminine. And I would then try and overcompensate and I'd overwork a center. And it's just learning, I think, for people to understand and dive into that energy and learn to work with it is a, is a bit of an art form because a lot of people aren't, we're not always aware of it. We're not aware that we're being driven by some of these energies because we're fully unconscious of them in certain ways. Um, this is a, a kind of a leeway into a deeper question, by the way. It's a... Um, your your work in the black witch and i want to i'm kind of i'm going to segue here a little bit because you've done a lot of work in the subject of soul retrieval and you know one of the things that i for example realized and this is a it's a it's a it's a was a relationship wound but mm -hmm. it obviously has a deeper kind of mental and emotional dimension to it i mean the reason i think we suffer so intensely when a relationship ends um, whether it's a personal or romantic or whatever, a friendship or a, you know, a loved one of some sort, when that ends, it's a deep portion of ourself is lost with it. You know, and I, I, I say that it's the beauty, it's the, you know, the Tiferet in a way that is, it's fragmented, it's destroyed, it's now past there. You're still stuck that it was that person, that place, that thing and event. Getting that back, recovering that, healing from that, uh, how does one go about it? What is, what is your recommended, you know, uh, summary, if we will? Uh, with that, you can definitely do rituals yourself and recover your soul pieces. Um, sometimes it's easier if you let other people do that for you because they kind of, um, because of the laws of spiritual balance, if someone does a ritual for you, it kind of works better or if you're doing rituals for someone else, okay. the law of balance, you will have, have an easier time recovering pieces. So- Is that also because you're not so intensely attached to it? You're not sabotaging it yourself because of your involvement or is it purely because of the spiritual balance? It's both, you know, okay. um, it could be both. 
Where was I? Um, with soul retrieval, uh, something I tell people about it is if it's a force that is uh, preying on you or something that stole a soul piece, whether, whether that was through a, a traumatic event in your life or whatever, that's something that has that piece of your soul is using that to, um, they're using it as a power device and they are, that's a piece of you that is a, a part of your power and they use that power in their own um, uh, existence. Mm -hmm. So when you do a soul retrieval, you are taking that back and reclaiming your power and sovereignty. Um, a factor is that they might come and try to take it back. They may attack you. And this happens uh, usually within a couple of days after you do a soul retrieval, you get intense anxiety, like ruminating thoughts and things like, like depression. You'll feel like shit. And that's because that entity is trying to say, you're shit, you're shit, you're shit, you know? It's trying to make you feel bad. And so they can take that piece back that, the, that you restored to yourself. That's okay. something I, I warn people about. And you can get through it, and you just have to stick to your guns and go through the process. And if need be, um, do the cursing ritual that you do for protection. Protection, um, that's part of it. Um, but like, it's so worth doing. It's hard work, but it's the same idea as cursing to get your power back. Except you're you're just taking the power back, and then you're cursing to keep that power. So I go back to cursing a lot, but kind of. <laughs> I, I, I think it helps paint uh, that idea because there's a bit of an authoritative, you know, claiming and taking and not being a victim, you know, giving yeah. up that victim mentality. I, I find I've been having this conversation a lot lately with a lot of people, including myself. And um, it's that idea of, you know, the attitude that a lot of us kind of have coming out of the, you know, subjugation in certain, or some, you know, coming out of the subjugation of the slave god or the slave species, so to speak, is this begging for mercy. You know, it's yeah. the, the second, you know, you see even with a lot of people coming into the path, you know, the first, at first they're all powerful. They're all like, I am the magician, I am the warrior, until stuff goes wrong. And then they're like, oh, please help me. You know, and there, there's this begging attitude versus that almost Viking-like attitude of accepting, um, I'm already dead. You know, death is already part of me. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to put that. I'm not going to bow down. You know, I'm going to be respectful, but I'm not going to bow down. I'm going to take that power back. And that's an attitude. Because if, if I think one perceives the entity or the force bigger than themselves, they've already lost, you know, oh. or, or more powerful than the self. I had a, one of my first spiritual teachers had a very nice example and he was a very, very gifted medium, a very gifted psychic. And we were teaching and training young spiritualists at the time. And they were all very frightened about spiritual manifestation. And the technique he taught them was very much a superficial technique, but the power of the belief, that firmness in themselves, that they had the ability to do something, that they weren't powerless was the first step in helping them to cultivate the right kind of attitude and the right kind of fears. And I think I, I sometimes say that one of the biggest things that we don't realize is that the auric field and the emotional body are so deeply intertwined. And if we're in a space where we were emotionally frightened, we're, we're making ourselves vulnerable orically, we're making ourselves vulnerable energetically. But one of the things that I really love that you pointed out, because I didn't even think about this for, you know, um, until you mentioned it, was that after effect, you know, because I've seen this even in cases with people that have gone through exorcisms and mm. they go through the exorcism and everything's fine and light and wonderful for a little bit. And then it's almost like everything comes back in force. And, you know, I feel like what you're saying here, it's almost like this is a common phenomenon. It's, it's, it's literally the same as the drug addict that's now going through withdrawal in a certain way at an energetic level. Could you, could you explore that a little bit more? And I, also want to ask if you can give some ideas on what someone can do. It goes back to uh, the determination that you have and the, the willpower that you have to move forward and not give up. You know, don't say, okay, take it back. Uh, you know, uh, don't, like you said, don't bow down. You got to be 
you have that sovereign attitude and um like if you there's always going to be a pushback from the matrix and it, it kind of it's like um everything is connected obviously and it's all one mind right mm. but there's perception filters in that mind and there's layers and layers of um identity that are created from that one mind and in order for people spirits identities to experience things they go through um this perceived separation and then they're fighting against uh the reflex of the magic that they're doing it's it's I'm trying to put it into words If you have the willpower to change something, the universe is going to be like, oh, oh, yeah, well, you know, here's this energy. And how much do you really want that? Because they they are the universe is part of you. The universe wants to see what you're made of and they will push back or it, he, she, it will push back. Um, and that's the nature of doing magic. You that's why, like I said, the willpower is very important and in how you apply your willpower, not just blunt force, but um, intelligently applying your knowledge that you have, your gnosis that they give you. Um, you'll hear while you're under attack or while you are having anxiety and depression, you will get hints as to what to do about it. And it's up to you to believe that or dismiss it. But you feel, you can kind of feel what's important there's a lot of confusion when you're in those states, but you just have to keep your presence of mind the best that you can and feel what messages are coming to you are legit and they are important and for you to listen to. Uh, it's like the universe will use um, confusion and like fear. They use fear and they manipulate your fear in order to um, confuse you or does that make sense mm, mm. I think um, it's you, you mentioned it earlier I, I think in the early portions when you said when the curse of a curse gets thrown at you especially if you're young it hits the weakest parts of the system yeah. and I think when we're in this process we're starting to cultivate the true will and really really live from that position all the kinks in the armor are almost going to be amplified in a certain way and we're going to have to it's 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 actually not evidence of we're on the wrong path it's the cost of being on the right path is perfecting that am i am i, am I right in my interpretation yes exactly thank you i couldn't have said it better myself um it, it brings the mud to the surface so to speak it's, yes. it's uh, water that is moving and it's it's water that is um having a lot of uh flow mm -hmm. so with that flow the mud rises and and it is removed you know you get purified so it's such a I such think. an important idea because i think it's also why you know the left hand path is really such a difficult path and firstly my absolute admiration for you because you were at that you were at a point you were you were dealing with the concepts of mental health and again it's one of the ideas that we're discussing here and inside of that you entered the left hand path you furthered your work inside of the left hand path and looking at the dark side of the tree and i think for most people that's almost like a a frightening thing they run the other way you know they run away from the thing that they fear you embraced you know the things that were were supposed to be feared and learned to work and transmute with that can you talk about that attitude and that perception that you have on that dimension of the tree and working with it? Because I think that's a nugget. You know, I've seen so many people. And I mean, one of the reasons I want us to discuss this, I've seen so many people that are good intentioned, you know, practitioners and they end up working with the tree of life, but there's so much mixed association. There's some, they can't really resolve these things and they manifest the clepothic energy in their life that they, you know, they just can't get through. How does, how does one transmute that? What's the other side look like? What's your attitude around that dimension? Okay. Uh, first of all, 
you have to be all in on the left hand path. Usually, if you're seeking to use the left hand path as a means of advancing and gaining power, uh, ascending spiritually, you can't half ass it. You know, you have to give it your all in, in all areas of your life. Yeah, going all in and the attitude of fearlessness. Um, when I do ritual and I call on the darkest, the most powerful beings that I can think of that are cathartic, I don't fear them because, and the more you do magic, the more you will develop the skill of controlling your fear. But I just don't, it's very rare that I would feel fear doing uh, left-hand path magic. I don't, because I, I just had it, I've gone over it so many times, I have it under control. And part of that is because of the things I've experienced in my life that were horrific or worst case scenarios um, that kind of like dulled the emotion of fear when it comes to magic. I don't, maybe I should have more fear, but I don't have much. And it's just, uh, it's just, you have to develop control of your fear emotion because these spirits, they will use that fear to test you all the time, like constantly. Uh, during ritual, they will, oh, if you do this ritual, something bad will happen. You know, they put little seeds in your mind that if you, if you ask for this, you're going to be in trouble. If you <laughs> challenge this entity, he's going to, you know, bitch slap you and ruin your life. You know, there's all kinds of thoughts hmm. that they will intentionally put in your head to see what you're made of, to see if you uh, give in to your fear. So, so again, that idea kind of comes back that um, you're asking for these things. You're trying to progress on a path of unlocking your own godhood, your own, you know, power, so to speak. And every single kink in the armor is going to come and, and be tested and refined. And you need to almost take your spiritual body and your psychological body to the gym. And you need to basically say, these are the weaknesses that I've got. And by entering this path, I am not going to get a cushion from them. I am going to actually have to honestly and sincerely own them and be willing to work them through. And I love what you pointed out in the beginning of that. You have to go all in. You can't, you can't test the water here. You're going to have to run the current until it's done. And the cost is who you were in a certain way. The cost is who you were before that. You have to be willing to go all the way in and all the way through. And I think fearlessness is a cultivated quality. There's this notion of the, the poison of Samael again. And the poison of Samael is this philosophy. Again, we, we, we drip the poison a little bit. So that slow systemic exposure to fear but unless you're actively exposing yourself to unless, unless you're in pieces, unless you're, you're doing it in a controlled way where you're tackling it, it's going to come to you in larger and larger levels ultimately. So it's almost like you're embracing the darkness and piece by piece, taking it in and refining yourself as a result of that. Now, there's a couple of things there that's here. And I want to kind of summarize a little bit about some of the stuff that we've spoken about, because I think it, it opens up some very pertinent questions and some pertinent ideas to somebody. There's a natural development that has to happen inside of yourself as an individual, where you start owning your authority, your sovereignty, and you stop taking crap, you know, in a sense like that. You, you're still respectful where you need to be, but you're not, you're no longer a pushover. You're no longer begging for mercy. You're taking what is yours. And you're challenging yourself and the system and the spirits to a degree, but by claiming your stake, by learning, still being willing to learn, still being willing to collaborate, but, but learning. But then at the same time, as you're deepening that, you recognize that you're going to be made aware of your weaknesses and you're either going to overcome them and deal with them and overcome them, or it's going to be the thing that ends up driving you and being your downfall, so to speak. Um, am I right so far in my assumptions here? No, it's absolutely true. Uh, that would be one of the um, warnings I would give people uh, uh, going down the left-hand path is 
if you're not willing to face those fears, you know, don't go this path, you know, mm. they'll, they'll put them right there in front of you and it will potentially um, be your downfall, like you said, and destroy you, uh, ruin you in a lot of ways if you're not willing to do what needs to be done, you know. I want to ask two questions um, in a kind of combined way. And I don't want to overload them because I think you actually cover this quite a lot in your book on soul retrieval and, and in your work in that, in that area. Um, but now we speak about protection and we mentioned that not everybody has uh, necessarily, they want to use a, a right hand path kind of practice. And we say one of the core things there is the attitude, the mindset by which they're approaching that. And almost like, you know, instead of the, the black magician doesn't, he necessarily need a protection he just goes straight out and curses the opponent he he goes in for the attack he's more proactive in that sense um but now on top of that i think one of the things is that your magical potency is mm. very much dependent on how much of you is in that fight you know that old phrase is not the size of the fight you know the, the the dog in the fight it's the size of the fight in the dog uh so to speak and one of the big, I think, tool sets for that, there's one is the attitude, obviously, that you've, you've spoken of quite a bit here. It's the, I'm going in for the curse. I'm going in for the fight. I'm proactively, I'm taking the Robert Greene approach. I'm a strategist of war. And you're very clear about that. You need to be strategic in your utilization of your magic in order to, you know, not just do the spell, but you need to see how these things fit together and go at it there's these portions that a lot of people are kind of stuck with. And I think this is the confusion when people think about the dark path. When we say dark path, we're talking about going inside, dealing with the darkness, transmuting it, finding the essence that needs to sit in there, really resolving it. It's not necessarily dark negative energy. Negative dark energy is almost when there's a trauma that I have not dealt with, you know, and that's the thing that's manifesting negatively in my life. And soul retrieval is a powerful system or a powerful tool for that. For somebody that's starting on this process, what if, you know, without revealing too much, or, you know, because you, again, you cover this in your book, what are, what are some basic psychological exercises or visualization exercises or even rituals that somebody can start to maybe start recovering a little bit of a part that they have lost or they need to build up with to start this process of coming into wholeness in order to build up their fight again? Um, while you were Asking that question, the idea of reclamation kind of came to mind. I don't know if you're if you know what that is. Where, what what a person can do to start um, with soul retrieval, or in addition to soul retrieval, is first of all, yeah, learn how to ground, learn how to shield yourself, learn how to curse your enemies if you need to. But exploring your past lives because. A lot of us are really old souls and yeah, we die in that person that we once were. We lose that power that he, he or she gained and then we were born into a new body. Mm. But that's, that's like um, leaving all the power and things that you learned from that past life in the past when you could take that and bring it into your present self. Mm. Why not? Um, do that, you know, and that's part of uh, soul retrieval in my, from my perspective is exploring your past lives through meditation or ritual or both, and then learning who you were, learning the most powerful manifestations of yourself, whether you were male or female in that life doesn't matter. Um, if you were a powerful person and you had skills that you want to have currently, you can bring those forward to yourself by doing, by like, you could channel a sigil of your past self. You could do a chant that calls them and then write your intention to reclaim all the power, all the knowledge, all the wisdom of that past self and bring it into your present self. Mm. Like, um, it's like, you're linking, you're creating a, a portal outside of time, okay? Like what Kenneth Grant would say. Hmm. You're going outside of time, outside the circles of time, accessing that fullness of yourself in all of your past lives, and one at a time, bringing them forward to who you are now. 
And for a lot of us, that includes past lives where we were witches and we were magicians, very powerful, maybe, maybe even back to Atlantis. And we can take that and bring it here and regain that power and create a whole self here and now. That's part of uh, soul retrieval. To that's, that's golden. That, that right there is, I think, a very a powerful place for someone to start with. I really love this this notion that you put forth about almost having a sigil of your past self, your other dimensional self and kind of bringing that in. Uh, people forget the idea that we could almost evoke and conjure those older dimensions of self and then bring them into the integration. Um, this, I think, opens up a very a beautiful segue. And I, I'll check now how much time I still got left with you. I'm enjoying our conversation so much. Um, and I think everyone listening is also finding quite a lot of value in this. But when one begins this journey of true authenticity, um, you start to cultivate your fight, you start to call this, uh, this independence, and you start to believe truly in the fundamental you and getting it fully together. More of it gets revealed. As you mentioned earlier, when, when you do that spell, when the negative stuff comes up, at the same time, the advice, the solutions also kind of come up, but it's up to you to trust yourself and open that spirit door almost and to start actively acting, cultivating the will to act upon these things and not just leave them in the realm of fantasy and imagination, but bring them, ground them in the will and do something about it. And at the same time, there's these powerful revelations, you know, you yourself revealing inside of the book, um, these, the demonic tongue and these pieces. How did, how did this come about for you? How did, those inspirations, how, how did that relationship, building that relationship and that trust in that connection come about? How did you cultivate it? And what advice can you give, you know, practitioners and seekers in order to build that connection and identify those things themselves? Um, for me, uh, what seemed to open it and establish stronger connections was having a spirit guide that would be there at all times. And for somebody uh, that could be a, a specific demon or it could be a relative who has passed, who is looking out for your best interest and uh, acting as the role of gatekeeper to knowledge that comes to you. Hmm. So for somebody who doesn't know how to access otherworldly other knowledge, can't talk, um, <laughs> Definitely, um, first ritual I would do is a ritual asking the goddess or the god of the highest variety, whichever that, whatever that is for you, um, for a spirit guide. Mm -hmm. Another option is in my book, The Black Witch, um, I have a rite in that book called the Rite of Attainment. And it connects you to your daemon. And your daemon is your reflection across the void of who you are. It's a connection to usually a demonic entity of some kind who is your manifestation on the other side of this reality, the mirror re reflection of yourself. That entity um, is the manifestation of your will on that level right so if you connect build a bridge across the void and connect with that entity he or she can guide you in your path and give you the information that you need they don't make it easy they won't spell it out for you but they will give you the hints the things that are, are most important are the things that are not spoken out loud something pops into your head randomly and you're like oh that's an interesting thought and then you dismiss it big mistake <laughs> if it pops in your head you got to be like oh shit, that's important and and then you take that information you validate it with a pendulum or or if you have telepath telepathic uh communication with your guides validate it with them they will validate it and then you take action like, and like I said, they won't validate it completely, mm. usually. Mm. They will validate it just enough so you have some doubt. Uh -huh. And overcome that doubt. So, 
that perfect, that perfect balance gives you just enough, but still keeps you in the space where you still need to challenge your own limitations in order to, yeah. to walk the path in full. Um, we're coming closer to the end of what time we have. There's a few more questions I need to get out of you before we get, you know, there. Um, but before I ask the other, the, the, the one I want to talk about around the fight, uh, there is a lot of misperceptions or a lot of mixed views about what that experience is directly like with the spirits. Um, a lot of things that are coming out there, a lot of people still have the Hollywood marketing kind of experience that, you know, I'm going to be in this deep ritual. The next moment, there's going to be a lot of physical blood, thirsty demons around me and all these things. And then there is the other conversation that it's it's purely psychological events. It's, it's just me tapping into my own subconscious. Um, what is, what is your uh, comment on that? And also, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what has been one of the stronger spiritual manifestations of a certain entity that's more consistent for you that you might be willing to share with us? Sure. As far as a strong manifestation, um, definitely uh, Lilith has been uh, very... Um, Lilith and Astaroth, I've seen them very clearly, like to the point where it looks like um, they are in the room with me, but my eyes are closed, but it's like looking at somebody like, like, like I'm looking at you now, mm. just extreme clarity, perfect skin, perfect beauty. And she had these brown eyes that were just glowing and her, her skin was glowing. It's just, um, I've had a lot of experiences like that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pick one that's the best. I used to, as far as like physical manifestations of things moving around, etc. Um, I was uh, at home once and then my door opened and closed on its own. <laughs> and then uh, I think it was Belial actually that walked in that one time and actually opened my, my fucking door and walked in. So it was pretty cool. So as far as that, they are definitely both because we are, our actual real mind is connected to the one mind and the one mind um, manifests all, you know, our reality, our physical reality. And our physical reality is also, it's not that as much different than the spiritual reality as we think, but because we are in, in this body and we have these perception filters that block out the reality that we're all the same consciousness, we think it's different. It's so it's both where we are. I always say we're a hundred percent individual, but we are also 100% the whole universe hmm. and we don't see it at all times. It sounds like um, right hand path talk a little bit. Um, but there's a huge difference between left-hand path enlightenment and right-hand path enlightenment. In the left-hand path, you become that one consciousness and control your reality. In the right-hand path, you're kind of surrendering to it more so. Mm. I know what Kenneth Grant talks about in terms of the, what Crowley also mentioned about the Black Brotherhood being almost one that stops just before the full surrender. Um, yeah. And, and channels that power into their manifestation of the individual. Well, um, I, I, I love that. I love that that's a resonance. And, and you know, it, it's a, I've asked the same question from a lot of different people. And I think this is part of where a lot of the confusion kind of comes in for, for many is we say that the spirits are within and we say that all, well, but the recognition is that there is fundamentally no within and no without at a quantum level. At a quantum level, we're all fundamentally one interrelated being. And that allows the spirit to have an independent existence, but we're all still fundamentally one force. So to, for us to fully actualize our true potential, we need to cultivate all those dimensions, all those facets. We need to invoke, be possessed, cultivate, mature, and initiate into those stages or degrees. It's not a simple task. It's not, a, it's not as quick as just learning a new habit or a new idea or a new concept. And it does sometimes cost the old self. There's parts that are constantly fragmented and transmuted. And I think this is where mental health is so important, right? Because... 
how do you, those shifts, those constant daily deaths to versions of self and versions of reality that I'm addicted to is the tough stuff. Um, what are some beliefs? What are some strategies that have helped you to do that and help you to continue to reach to new levels? Okay. So um, you've probably read the book of the law and, they, and in the book of the law, I believe it's new ISIS. She says, um, veil not your vices. These vice, vices are my servants or service, something like that, where she's saying that the things that are hard for you to control your indulgences or laziness or whatever it is, eating a lot, um, smoking a lot of pot, doing any kind of drug that you're addicted to and you have a hard time controlling it. It could even be a uh, sexual indulgence you can take those things and use them to build your willpower and strengthen yourself. Whatever is your biggest weakness, your strongest vice is what they will use to strengthen your will. So that's kind of a, a way of doing it that is very effective, mm -hmm. so. Bold and strategy. Um, I, I, I put a quote out a while back and I said, uh, how, Notice during the day when you get the vision, because you get the idea, we're in the ritual, you do the spell, you do the magic, and you get the idea of what you need to do. And then the next day, you're out there, and you're supposed to be doing your will, you're doing that you're supposed to be exper experimenting with the will. And then 10 minutes in, you're on your cell phone, or you're out getting the third cup of coffee that you really <laughs> didn't need. And all of these are, are the vices. You know, there, there's, yeah. there's, there's the things that distract you from truly present action on that. And I think that's the tough part for people. They've got this, this magical attitude about magic, you know, that it's, you know, I go in, I do the little ritual and that's it. Now they're the gods, the spurs, they're going to just do everything for me. And it's like, I've got, you know, Netflix, you know, for reality. And I'm not saying, I, I think we're saying that it's impossible to achieve such a state of consciousness and such a state of energy manifestation, but it's not a starting point. You know, the starting point is we need to cultivate the will and cultivate the power of action and cultivate that follow through in order to get to that space. And that's the only way we're going to be strengthened energetically enough in order to deal with the rest of that power and rest of those energies that come through. Um, is that something you agree with? Absolutely. And not only that, but the build up to the ritual of manifestation that you're doing, mm -hmm. taking your time and setting everything up exactly how it needs to be set up and building up the power of of your will by intoning manifest intoning uh invocations and evocations and accessing the sources of power and pushing those towards your goal and accessing the appropriate ones to do that like that's a big part of it is like for example if you were going to do a ritual to manifest um anything in life, you could um, discipline yourself by fasting or, uh, like I said, not indulging in a vice that you're usually very indulgent with for days before the ritual. And then you do the ritual and that energy is released. And then you, you can go back to your normal ways. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. In fact, it just, you know, the, the thought that, that comes to mind for me as I, as I hear you say that is that the greatest sacrifice that you can offer on the altar of your magic are your vices. You know, they are, you know, is that a, I feel like that's, that's a, that's a your, your comforts, your, you know, things, because the spirits, they, they don't necessarily want your blood all the time or incense those are important factors you know using your some of you in blood and ritual and using incense but they want to see what it's worth to you they want to see what you're made of and there's more likely more chance of success if you're willing to sacrifice those things mm -hmm. if only temporarily before a ritual I and if, especially if they ask you to do it and and you're willing to do it to to show them that you're serious that has that goes a long way that's 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 a golden one i think uh, because it's also twofold it's you you're getting the instruction and you taking that inner reality seriously 
uh, which means you're fundamentally taking yourself and your magic seriously, which is a, a prerequisite almost. I think that people need to kind of keep in mind in that sense. Um, there's, there's two things, two last ones I want to try and get out of you before we, before we end this one. So I'm going to ask them together <laughs> so it doesn't look like I'm, I'm dragging them out even more. Um, it is because we spoke a lot about, you know, the fight and mentioned the strategy um, and things like that. Uh, I want to ask, so my twofold question is, what are three fundamental beliefs, just core beliefs, that you feel someone should have in order to be successful at their magic and mm -hmm. really building that relationship with this inter with, with, with the demonic? Uh, mm -hmm. That's the one part of the question. Um, yeah. So what are three fundamental beliefs someone needs to have in order to be successful in their magic? Okay. And the second part to that is if you were to open up right now to spur it to the guys to you know our mother our beloved mother Lilith or whoever is inside of the space um, to just share a transmission or an idea or a concept that that feels is something that the world needs to hear or the listeners need to hear could you share that as well with us sure I could try um, let's go to the first part the three fundamental beliefs um, that's that's a hard question to answer because there's so many beliefs that are important and it's so um, subjective in a lot of ways. Obviously, believing that you are your own master and being the leader when doing your rituals, being the leader and not the submissive one. Mm. Okay. Not in a disrespectful, disrespectful way, but in the way that you are acknowledging that you are also a divine uh, manifestation of the demonic you're acknowledging that and you're saying hey i'm at your level in this respect i might not be as strong as you yet but i'm at your level and uh, i have um i respect you and you respect me as a divine demonic being mm. so that would be one um it's such a good one though it's such a good one because i think that's <laughs> that's one of the big problematic attitudes i think you get you that's such a gold one because a lot of people they go in, it's almost, they still take the right hand path kind of attitude that, you know, I'm not good enough here. You all have the power, you know, what can I pay you, give you to make my problem go away instead of, you know, you're a member of the board and, mm -hmm. you know, this is our empire. We're leading this together. Um, everyone's got their own resources. I'm the one with the direction. You're not looking for spirit for your purpose. You know what your purpose is mm -hmm. and you're collaboratively bringing that together. That's that's a powerful one already. So thank you already for that one. Sure, no problem. The second one I would say is, I'm gonna rip off Jonko Willock a little bit and say discipline equals power. <laughs> I mean, he says discipline equals freedom, but in my experience, freedom is power and discipline would equal power also. Nice. So discipline, nice. the strength of mind is so important. And thirdly, just believing that no matter what level you're at in your magical development, the universe isn't gonna, um, unless you're just uh, making all the wrong choices and going um, in a way that is against who you really are as a person and not being yourself, the universe isn't gonna like destroy you. You know what I mean? Um, as far as believe that you have enough power to do the things that you need to do for yourself, the things that you need to do, the things that you want for yourself, um, you have enough power to do those things. You have tap, you know, if you tap into your heart and you want a certain thing for yourself, you feel that you um, are meant to do a certain thing, you have a purpose, you can do that if you feel it in your heart and you want it, believing that. That's a fundamental for me that matters, you know. That, that. I never thought uh, at first that that I could be an author or a good magician at any point. And then it just, I wanted it, but I didn't believe it. And then, you know, things, you know, the universe bitch slapped me, said, hey, wake up, life is short, take what you want, you know, 
and just do what you want to do with your life. That's and, that's gold. Um, thank you, thank you. Those are those are those are really powerful pieces, um, and I love that. I love that ending, especially because I can feel your heartfelt, you know, with that one. That that's something that comes from a really personal place, um, which you know I thank you for sharing. Uh, I think. You know, I, I recently also there was this journey for myself, and I think for a lot of people in our society today, uh, people with the pandemic, COVID, everything else that's going on, never before has, I think, we're, in our current generation, it's been more obvious about the painful reality of death and slavery mm -hmm. and all these other things. And the fact of the matter is that we do not necessarily know how many days we have left. And we, if we are not taking ourselves seriously, if we're not acting and believing in ourselves, what do you have to lose? You might not be here tomorrow. And I think there's a beautiful depiction in that sense with Kali standing over the body of Shiva. You know, we have this endless list of ideas and consciousness and concepts that come up to us, but we have to, and the message I think of Kali is dual fold there. It is one, it is time that we have a limit and it's death at the same time. We have to both limit those ideas into time and space by cultivating the will. And it's not going to be easy. That's where the real fight is. And unless you have that fight, someone else is going to take what's yours and you're not going to bring to this world your sacred daemonic. You're not going to bring to this world what is missing. You're not going to be able to transmute what is fundamentally wrong with this reality because you're not participating. And that's what we need. We don't need, we don't need witches that are hiding out just in their covens or just in their temple rooms. Go to the temple room, go to the coven, do the magic, do the work, get the inspiration and the wisdom we need, but then bring it into the community, you know, bring it into the world. You know, as I was having the conversation with Thomas uh, recently, uh, Thomas Carlson from the Dragon Rouge, and he pointed out this idea of the global united nightshade. You know, the point was that it didn't matter if you were Dragon Rouge or you were Temple of Set or you were this or you were that. The fact of the matter is we are all on the left-hand path. You know, everyone listening to this podcast, listening to this piece, we're all the outsiders. We're all the different ones. We're all the weirdos. You know, we're, we're the witches, for God's sakes. And unless we're going to take ourselves seriously and believe in the message that's in our heart, which is a sacred one, I can, I can truly, you know, just speaking to you and getting to know you, there's a genuineness that comes through, you know, it's not like these black magicians are all these evil people, you know, we, it turns out most of us are actually pretty good, genuine human beings. We need to believe in each other and we need to believe in ourselves and we need to bring that action through, you know, thank you so much, you know, for the wisdom. If you might just take a few moments or a second and take a breath in and allow whatever spirit wants to share through you, you know, Sure. I'll see, uh, you know, I'm sure my guys are here and I will close, I'm just going to close my eyes and see what comes through. Okay. Like I, when I close my eyes, I'm just seeing like a line, my guys are like going right to you. And I don't know if they're saying something directly to you, but I see like a line of their energy going right to your third eye. And yeah, I can, I can feel the energy actually very directly between as we're working. So maybe they're going to give you the message, <clears throat> not to put you on the spot, but my, um, my message, I think I've said all everything I need to say, and let me just, I'm just getting, you know, I feel like it's a personal message for you, but there's more coming for you is the message. It sounds so, um, Not like it's not much information, but more coming for you. You understand is what's is like you personally, and maybe for people who are watching this, those who uh, it kind of goes into one of my ideas that that I heard from Paimon is that there's an unlimited reservoir of knowledge and wisdom within each person, to the extent that you're you're irreplaceable. You know what I mean. You can't be replaced with somebody else, with somebody else's wisdom, because you are the wholeness of yourself. Does that make sense? It's actually, it's actually interesting because um, one of the when I started this morning off, I was doing a teaching inside of the cult, and the subject that I was teaching was in the area of sex magic. And that I boiled down to the thing is that it's easy for us to get caught up in the idea of sex magic because it's exciting. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people are attracted to it because they're attracted to the pleasure. And the catch is 
how much pleasure do we permit ourselves? How much love do we allow ourselves? How much knowledge and power do we permit ourselves to have? And I think that's actually a beautiful conclusion to you know, what we've been speaking about. Because a lot of people are out there, they're looking for the power there. It's somewhere, it's somewhere else, it's some other thing. You know, when I find that partner, when I make that money, when I do that thing, instead of recognizing, we're saying that, you know, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of hell, all of the dimensional parts are inside of you right now. How yeah. much of that power are you allowing? How much of that knowledge are you allowing? Because I think... And this was something that I was almost inspired to say earlier on. And you were, you were talking about, um, you know, just the journey of going in and, and accessing those, those portals and those dimensions and what we needed to sacrifice, you know, the work that we had to put in, in order to really make that ritual work. You know, we shouldn't just be lazy and do it half-hearted. We should put in the effort. We should put in the discipline. And there was a quote that, you know, has been coming up for me recently. And I've just posted it actually a few days ago. And it is that magic is the art and science of beauty of which the metric is surrender. And it's utilizing the arts. It's utilizing these things to recognize there is, as you say, this endless reservoir of power and energy um, and knowledge and gnosis within us. And all we're doing really with magic sometimes is we're distracting the critical factor. We're distracting the lie you know, with such grace and such beauty and such perfection and such sacrifice that we can surrender to that dimension to open up in full. Thank you again so much. It's been an absolute honor and a gift to share this, this, this platform with you. And I do hope that, you know, in the future, we might be able to have some more because I think there's a lot more knowledge here, you know, that people, people can gain um, if you'd be willing to chat to me again in the future. Yeah, I'm working on a new book and... You know, once I get that published or before it's published even, you know, I'd be happy to jump on again and discuss it with you. Absolutely. That would, that would be happen. exciting. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. That would be so amazing. Thank you so much. Enoch, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. This has been a great gift. And I think for our community as well, people and everyone that's listening here today, a lot of the ideas I think that came through today's subject is something that's a lot more important than just the fact of a podcast or a conversation. Our mental health and our mental well-being as practitioners is something that's sometimes so often overlooked inside of our community. People always take this attitude that you've got to be super tough and super strong because you're a left-hand path magician. That strength, that power is cultivated. Learn from those, learn from people that are willing, that openly sharing this knowledge, like Enoch sharing today his ideas and his experiences. Pick up a copy of the book, take some of these information, go look at some of his other videos and some of the other ideas, but make sure you take this information seriously because when the path begins, when you're on that path, take the help, you know, take the advice from people that are further along the way because it's going to take everything from you, but it's going to open up everything inside of you. So make sure you do the work. Enoch, thank you so very much for being with us today. It's been an honor, sir, and good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Hey family, it's Adam Knox here. Thanks for supporting this podcast and you know these ideas. I really appreciate free thinkers, you know, like yourselves that are willing to challenge conventional norms and think for themselves and take on new challenges and look at new ideas. And as such, I want to say that if you haven't yet, if you are looking at ways to improve your knowledge over the entire field and you're looking at a you know regular feed of ideas and concepts to keep improving yourself i'd like to invite you to sign up at the cult of you all my teachings and all my ideas are there for only 19 dollars a month and every month 
I bring you a completely new section of some of the most cutting ideas and I'm constantly adding to that. So I'm constantly reviewing and adding more knowledge as I gain them. And you'll see a lot of the interviews and a lot of things that I do extend on some of the subjects that I cover inside of those areas. I do take quite a bit of effort to make sure that the filming is also quite good and to give you not just a demonstration of rituals, but also talk you through the psychology behind them so that you're empowered to do them. And I cover every subject under the sun from science to art to magic to all the different systems out there from the golden dawn to the western of the western traditions to the left hand path traditions we discuss technology and technomancy we discuss sex magic and seduction we discuss so much more from purely the mental aspects to how do you deal with the darkness when it comes up as well as how do you take those things into business and into your romantic life as well as what are the keys to make your magic work as well as to unlock different degrees of spirituality so if you haven't yet please consider signing up at the cult of you and you'll be able to send me a mail and message there and i'll be there to help you you personally through mail correspondence and chat you and guide you through the entire process and if you make it through the first year of the entire cycle and you graduate the second year of the program you're able to have direct sessions with myself and some of the members of my temple and i look forward to helping you whether you go that route or not please keep enjoying these podcasts please share them with people that you think they are they're going to find value in them like and subscribe to the show and please send me your messages to info at the cult of you i would love to hear what are things that are important to you what are th- ideas and concepts that this raised maybe this inspired you maybe this you know made sense to you maybe this opened up something i'd love to hear that please talk to me and please share with me write in the comments and give me your ideas and concepts if you're watching this on the youtube channel if you're not if you're only watching this on the youtube channel please hit on over to spotify and do subscribe and if you're listening to this on spotify go check us out on youtube but please share this share these ideas and these concepts and let's let's have a conversation i'd love to hear from you that's it for me i'm adam knox this is the cult of you and remember live deliciously.